of our message today is called Lessons from the Mountaintop. Uh, Lessons from the Mountaintop. Today will be a great reminder for all of us that Jesus is our focus. Everything is about Jesus. Our pursuits, our loves, Jesus is our reason for everything, and today uh, the, the text here will remind us of this very thing, that Jesus and Jesus and more Jesus. I'm not sure about you, but I could hear about Jesus every minute of the day, just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And maybe for you, you would love to exchange all of the rest of the talk in this world for more Jesus. Just, just tell me about Jesus. I'm not sure about you, but when I hear about Jesus, I get a little excited. I start to smile a little bit. Tell me more about Jesus. Well, my hopes for us uh, today is that as we learn more about Jesus, that you would uh, desire to, uh, to pursue Jesus in a great way. When you get to Mark chapter 9, give us an amen. If you're new to following you some Jesus and reading your Bible, Mark is in the New Testament. It goes Matthew and then the book of Mark. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13 today. And then also, those of you that were here with us for a pull-up pickup yesterday, we'll watch a video after communion. It's about four minutes long, but we had a wonderful, wonderful time yesterday of meeting our community and so many people just in tears and just grateful to receive a free Christmas gift. So you'll see the video after communion time. All right, so Mark chapter 9, everybody there? All right, Mark chapter 9 says this. It says, and he said to them, speaking of Jesus, Jesus is talking. He says, assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Verse 4, and Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered, and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly they had looked around, and they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen, till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And the church said, amen and amen. Well, this is an amazing chapter. So Jesus starts off in verse 1 and he says, there are some standing here. Remember, uh, two weeks ago when we were together, uh, Peter, uh, Jesus talked about what was the cost of following him. You might remember. You know, might also remember that I said, next time you guys go to a restaurant and the waitress asked you what you should, what do you want? And you're supposed to say, whatever you want to give me. Who did it? Anybody? How did it work out for you? Laugh. Laughed. Did you really do it though? Was it good food? Amen to that. Those of you that weren't here um, two weeks ago, uh, Jesus talked about um, if we're going to come after him, if we're going to follow after him, that we were to deny ourselves. And we talked a lot how when we go to restaurants, how it's all about us. Make my steak a little, just medium rare. Give this. Don't give this. So I, so I owe you 20 bucks. So I, I <laughs> man, <laughs> so, so I, I, I challenged all of you. The next time you go to a restaurant and the waitress asked, uh, what would you like? Just simply tell her, whatever you want to bring me, I will be content with. So 20 bucks is coming your way. See me after church and I'll find my wife and she'll give me some money to give to you. <laughs> Back to the message, right? 
So, so Jesus says, surely I say to you that there are some that are standing here. So Jesus was talking to a crowd of people. And he says that some that are standing here won't taste death until they see the kingdom of God uh, present with power. Now, uh, some believe that this is speaking of many people are going to uh, be privy to his resurrection, that Jesus was seen by over 500 people at one time. Some also believe that this is speaking of the transfiguration that we're going to continue to read about today. Others believe possibly Pentecost when the Spirit of God uh, fell, but I believe it's regarding or referring to the transfiguration. He goes on to say, now after six days, this was six days after Peter's pronouncement that you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. The Bible says that Peter, that Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain. So Peter, James, and John are what's called the inner circle. So as you're reading your Bible, you'll always read in this order, Peter, James, and John. So Jesus spent more time with Peter, James, and John than he did with the other nine. Uh, James would uh, be one of the first apostles uh, to die as a martyr, the first of the 12 disciples to uh, die as a martyr. Peter obviously was a, uh, one of the pillars of the church, as was James, and we'll talk about them in a little bit. The Bible says that Jesus led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. This mountain was most likely Mount Hermon. Its highest peak was around 9,300 uh, feet above sea level. I believe currently in uh, Israel, they use it for a, as a ski resort. But the interesting thing is, the background is this. Listen to this. And this is from the Compelling uh, Truth website. It says, historically, Mount Hermon was home to the Sidonians who called it Mount Sarion. And the Amorites, who called it Sinir, and this is in Deuteronomy 3. Moses defeated Og, king of Bashan, there before being prohibited from crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Listen to this. The Canaanites used Mount Hermon as a place of worship for the pagan god Baal. And many temples and sites have been discovered in its caves. We learned two weeks ago in the city of Caesarea, which is on the bottom of Mount Hermon, they had... Um, etched in a cave, I showed you a video, to the god named Pan. So it's interesting, at the base of Mount Hermon was uh, dedicated to a god named Pan, and then at this uh, mountaintop, the Canaanites used to use it, and you're going to see how it is going to make sense in just a few minutes. The Bible says that he was transfigured before them. That means Jesus was transformed. We get the word metamorphosis from the Greek word metamorpho, my we get our word to change form, this metamorphosis. Uh, verse 3 says that his clothes became exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth could launder them. Now, you're probably not excited about some of that background, but then we remember Revelation chapter 21, when it says the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of what? God illuminated the lamb is its what? Light. So all that you and I know of since we were this big, we go outside, we see this huge ball of fire in the sky, and that's called the sun. None of us know light without the sun. But when we get, when we cross over to heaven, Jesus is going to be the light. How do you even imagine that, right? Imagine this, if possible. Jesus in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, his radiance is going to be the light. What do you do with that? Because all we see is sun, and we, we, we know that light. But there is not going to be a sun in heaven. There's going to be the S-O-N, not the S-U-N. And the S-O-N is going to just release everything and he is going to be the brightness even brighter than the sun hallelujah well, warren worsby says it like this jesus allowed his glory to radiate through his whole being and the mountaintop became a holy of holies so before when it was dedicated to the worshipers of pan and the, the amorites and the canaanites now that jesus is on the mountaintop it is like a holy of holies. Well, verse 4, it says, Elijah appeared to them 
with Moses. Now, if you're new to, uh, to, to walking with Jesus, Elijah and Moses were uh, what we call prophets of the Old Testament. You might remember Moses from the Charleston Heston uh, films that they show uh, during uh, Easter time. Well, Moses is the one that God used to led, lead his people out of Egypt. When he led them out of Egypt, uh, Moses, uh, uh, they led him to the Red Sea. Pharaoh was pursuing them, and then Moses was like, hey, God, well, we're stuck now. So God says, hey, raise your staff. Moses raises his staff, the Red Sea parts, and they, they walk on through. And Moses is also the guy that he went up on the mountain, and he had the Ten Commandments. And Elijah was a, was a prophet, and he's one of the prophets that you may have heard about where he um, went up to heaven in a chariot of fire. He's also one of the prophets that called down a fire from heaven when uh, Baal worshipers and, them and uh, Elijah were having a little, a little battle. So Moses and Elijah are now on the mount talking with Jesus. And to the meat of our text. Verse 5, and then Peter answered and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, uh, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why? Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Our first point this morning, if you're a note taker, is a desire to stay a desire to stay. So Moses, or not Moses, uh, Peter being a, a Jewish boy, so from this tall, he learned about the, uh, the prophet. So seeing Moses and Elijah, you can imagine, was like, whoa, the Ten Commandments guy is, is right here. Elijah, the guy that went up in a chariot of fire, he's right there talking to Jesus. Jesus, let's stay. Jesus, not only let's stay, but I want to build some houses. This word tabernacle is a permanent dwelling place. Uh, how many of you have ever had the, the privilege of walking up a mountain? Couple? You know how we stop a couple times? <laughs> so Peter is saying, let's stay here. Not only let's stay here, but let's build something. Peter, there's no Home Depot around where you are. There's no wood around where you are. Peter, how are you going to build something on top of a mountain? The Bible says he didn't know what to say. I love Peter because sometimes we, we don't know what to say either. You ever talk to somebody and maybe ask for some directions or something and you, you were more confused after talking with them <laughs> than you were before? So Peter doesn't know what to say, but he's saying, it's good for us to be here, so let me build three tabernacles that we might Stay here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, we could understand, you know, Peter's seeing, you know, his heroes of the faith, and he's like, hey, oh my goodness, I want to dwell, I want to build something and live here. Now, we could say, Peter, that's, that's, that's admirable. You see your, you know, your heroes of the, of, of the faith. But family, last chapter, we, we read, Jesus said the Son of Man would be betrayed. The Son of Man would be, uh, be killed, but he would rise again the third day. Jesus said that anyone wants to uh, follow me, they must take up their, their cross and follow me. So Peter is wanting to stay, but this is the second time that Peter, at least in this occasion, that he indirectly doesn't want Jesus to go to the cross. Jesus has told him previously, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to rise again. And now the very next opportunity, Peter is saying, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, let's stay here. Family, there's, there's a cross in the future. But here's Peter again saying, Jesus, this is good for us to be here. Let's, let, let's stay here. <laughs> Enough about whatever the cross means, whatever the resurrection means. Let's just, let's just stay here. Now, there's been some phenomenal times in my personal life where it felt like God was this close to me. I'm like, we need to stay right here. I don't want to go home. I don't even want to move. I hope nobody even comes by and touches. I just want to just, I just want to, just want to see. Have you ever, ever been there? Where in, in old school Calvary Chapel, we used to call those afterglows. <laughs> you just had some worship. 
you were just waiting on the Spirit of God to move. And, and, and when, as the Spirit moved, you're just like, I hope tomorrow never happens, right? I just want to just be there. And maybe some of you understand what you've gone to, a, a woman's retreat or a men's retreat, and, and just everything was just clicking. God was speaking. You're like, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down, God. And it was like you and God were having this, this, this really uh, intimate time, and you didn't want to leave. We understand that. You'll see this quote on the screen here. What you learn on the mountaintop is to equip you for the valley. What you learn on the mountaintop is to equip you for the valley. Uh, so often, we, we, when we get here with God, I just want to stay. I just want to stay. There's a few reasons why, Peter, you, you can't stay. The first, what about the other nine of your brothers that are on the bottom of the hill, which we'll learn about next week with their encounter, so you got to come to church next week. I see all your faces. What about the other nine? Sometimes, family, we're so focused on ourselves and what God is doing. Everyone around us can be starving, but hey, you and I are meeting with God. This is great. What about the other nine that are down on, on, the, on the bottom of the hill? Peter's like, forget them. Let's, let, let's, let's build something for us. Build something that we might continue this. Uh, forgetting or not realizing that what we learn up here with God is going to help us down here with this. What we learn here at church is going to help you at home. What you learn here at church is going to help you when you, you get to work. What you learn here at church should help you when somebody cuts you off on the freeway. <laughs> Whether you're the offender or the offendee. So Peter's saying, let, 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 let's stay. If they were to stay... As I mentioned before, James was the, the first of the 12 apostles to die a martyr's death. Tradition says Peter was crucified upside down. John, they boiled in oil and he survived and he wrote the book of Revelation along with 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the Gospel of John. And the third reason, Peter, why you can't stay is there, there's much to accomplish, that there is a cross in your future, Peter. There's a cross in Jesus's future. And uh, what, what, when's Christmas Eve? Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Friday, Friday, Friday. Friday. We're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And like many of you, you receive the cute Christmas cards and, you know, there's a little baby and his parents are going. <laughs> so cute. The backdrop of the manger is the cross. Think about this. Nowhere in Scripture are you and I ever told to remember the birth of Christ, but we are to remember his resurrection. Think about that. Remember his death, burial, and resurrection. Nowhere in Scripture does it say, remember the birth of Jesus. But Jesus says of himself, remember the death, burial, and resurrection. We're going to have communion later on today. So we're called to remember his death but not his birth. Pretty interesting, right? So we look at the manger. The backdrop is a cross, so they can't stay on the mountaintop because if Jesus stays on the mountaintop, then all of us are still in our sin. And if we're all still in our sin, then we are wasting our time here this morning. If you and I are still in our sin, that means we have no hope for, for life after, after death. So Jesus could not stay on the mountaintop because he told him in Mark 8, 31 that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Peter heard these words, but he still said, Jesus, let's stay. Jesus, this is good up here with you. We should stay. Let's forget about the world and let's stay. But listen to verse 7. It says, And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Our next point this morning is Jesus is the focus. Jesus is the focus. Uh, as Peter is babbling, God the Father interrupts his babbling. Peter, just shh. This word from God the Father said, this is my beloved son, hear him. If I can come to your front door for a second, 
This is the, the second time that God the Father has uh, reaffirmed his love for his son. Uh, the first time, does anybody remember? Baptism of Jesus. God the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is the second time that God the Father says, this is my beloved son. We know Jesus was the, the God-man. So in his humanity, I wonder how it, how it felt, not that we're like into a whole bunch of feelings, but how did it feel for Jesus to hear from his father, yeah, this is my beloved son. I'm well pleased with him. If I can come and kick down the men's door this morning, how many of us would have loved to have affirmation from our father, right? Son, I love you. God's got this great plan for your life. Keep your focus on Jesus. Everything is going to work out. You're going to struggle, but I want you to know I see a godly man in you. Can you imagine our dad telling us that from this high to this high to this high to this high? But I can imagine like many of us, like me, uh, we didn't have that, that affirmation. So I want to encourage you dads, whether your kids are this hall, this tie, this, this hall, or whatever. What's it? This hall. This, we make up new words on Sunday, so keep, keep coming. The new word is hall. Tall and hall. Whether you're holding your baby or they're walking next to you, you need to affirm them. Shoot them a text. Give them a call. If they're in, 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 in close vicinity, come on over. I just want to talk to you for a second. Just give them a hug and say, you know what? I am so pleased with you. You are growing into a godly man. And do the same with, with your daughters, fathers. I have five grandkids, uh, four granddaughters and one grandson. Every time I see him, I say, how's the pretty ladies doing? <laughs> hey, pretty lady, how are you doing? So if no one ever tells them anything, at least they, they've heard every day from, from grandpa, hey, that, that I'm pretty and that Jesus loves me and that Jesus has a plan for, for, for my life. So I want to encourage you, parents, affirm your love to your kids, I can tell you, they need to hear it. You might say, well, they don't deserve it. Well, neither do you and I, <laughs> right? So as you and I are feeding them money, right, before we give them and do that transfer, hey, I just want you to know before I transfer this. So at, before each transfer, give an affirmation. Before each transfer of money, give an affirmation. Hey, before I give you this money, I want you to know Hey, God's got a plan for your life. You just need to focus in, son, daughter. God, we were, church, we're praying for you. Send each time. And for some of you, you send a lot. So there should be a lot of affirmations <laughs> coming, right? So God the Father uh, uh, affirmed Jesus. But it's interesting that God the Father said, this is my beloved son. Hear, Hear him. Moses is there and Elijah is there. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. Why didn't God the Father say, hey, Moses and Elijah hear you. I want you to hear them. He said, this is my son. Hear him. What was God doing? He said, hey, you guys need to not be all starstruck with Moses and Elijah. There's somebody here that's greater than Moses and Elijah. I need you to hear, hear, hear him. I know you're looking at go, whoa, Moses, we heard about all the great things. God the Father said, eh. Hear him. Of, of, of everything else, I need you to hear. You need to hear, hear him. And, and family, we live in this world today where our focus is, is, is we need to walk around with spiritual glasses on. Because our focus sometimes is just. And then we have the audacity to blame God. What are you looking at? What are you listening to? Because what you look at and listen to determines your focus. If you're just, help me, Jesus. Let's go. Let's do it. If your focus is coming in from the TV, it's all dumping in here. God the Father says, you know what? Moses is there. Elijah is there. TV is here. Politics are here. All of these things are here. But I need you to hear my son. I need you to, I need you to, 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 hear, to hear this. When was the last time we read the Bible and we're like, oh, I'm not sure if that's true. But we turn on the TV and we hear something from the news. We're like, yeah, no, that's not true. Uh-uh. So 
we have to filter what we hear from the TV, we can simply read this and believe it. What's your, what's your focus on? And God the Father said, hear him. This is my beloved son. Hear, hear him. So if I can ask you finally, what's your focus this morning? 2021 is almost gone. Isn't that crazy? Almost gone. What's your focus been this year? I hope it's been some Jesus. If not, maybe it's been the ulcer you have, just just the, the, the stuff that's going on in our world. But if, we're, if our focus is Jesus, it's, we're just marching. We're just marching forward. When uh, I don't know much about horses, but I know that that once in a while they'll, they'll put some 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 blinders on the horses that they can only see straight. Right? When was the last time you saw a horse running looking back? <laughs> Is that even possible? I don't think it's even possible. So they, they put these things on the horse that he can just see this. See why it's in front of him. So, so if, we, if we could do something like get, get, get two Bibles and just, just keep me focused. That if I just, this is going to keep me looking, looking straight. Because without this, have you noticed that? What's that over there? Jesus. Jesus, keep me, keep me focused. This time on the mountain was so great for, for Peter. He mentions it when he wrote uh, his letter to the churches in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. Listen to what he says. He says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. If Peter never left the mountain, he would never have written 1 Peter or 2 Peter. It says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. Quote, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard this, bo this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter's telling the church, we were eyewitnesses to this excellent glory. Peter's saying, I was there, that our faith is not, oh, I hope this whole Jesus thing is true. No, our faith is, is, a, is a, a step in the light with our eyes wide open. Peter's saying, I was an eyewitness. And family, Satan is at work. And he's not at work in flat tires and broken down refrigerators. He's at work in causing you and I to doubt. He's at work in causing you and I to to doubt. Is that whole Jesus thing real? Is that whole Jesus thing true? You know, there's all kinds of contradictions in the Bible. When people ever say that, ask them, give, give me one. Just give me one. Well, you know, they're all over the place. Okay, just give me half of one. Not there. We need to be mindful. We need to be mindful. So in the past, listen to Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by what? By the prophets. Who's on the mountaintop right now? Elijah and, and Moses. And they are prophets. Good job, everybody. Listen to verse 2. But has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has the appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So the Bible is telling us, listen to the one that's made everything, right? So that's why when people come to you for advice, point them to Jesus because you and I don't really have too much to say. God forbid I tell you what I think, right? Because <laughs> it's based upon where I've been in my experiences. But if I tell you what the word of God says, oh, that's eternal. I want to lead you to the one that made the worlds. I want to lead you, this is what Jesus says about you and about your situation. Because if we tell people what we think, well, sometimes we go a little too easy on people. And sometimes some of you go too hard on people. You don't always need to use a hammer to correct people. You're like, is the service over already, man? I don't think I like this guy. We're, we're not coming back next Sunday. Put your hammer down. Put your, when's the last time God said, I'm going to rip off your toenails if you don't receive me? But yet, sometimes we as his people misrepresent. Just point people to Jesus. Let, 
Let Jesus work on people's uh, fornication. Let Jesus work on people's lives. Let Jesus work on people's uh, issues. Because we're, we're going to be late. <laughs> the only difference between us and the world is Jesus. Because most of y'all, bunch of cursing, fornicating, druggies, alcoholics, not any too many amens. I, I, know, I know you're all saved and dressed up in that church right now. Take Jesus from your life and, and we do the same things that we see people doing today. So we want to say, let me point you to somebody that can change this. When this changes, all of the outward changes when, when this changes. Our problem is we hear things and we want to change this before this right here. Jesus wants this. Jesus has this. Your, 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 your attitude is going to change. Your living situation is going to change. Your joy is going to change. Your peace is going to change. That's why the Father says, hear him. Hear him. Hear, hear Jesus. Let's, let's bring people to Jesus. In the past, he spoke through the prophets. Now he speaks through his son. Jesus Christ. That's why it's important, family. Uh, if you're looking for a, a Bible-believing church, uh, great. Here at Calvary Chapel Beaumont, we take you verse by verse through the Bible. That way, you get to hear everything that God wants you to know. We not skip around. We talk about every issue that comes up in the Bible. Why? That you and I might know what God thinks. Because there's a few places in the Bible where we're like, God, I guess we're going there today, God. But we got to talk about it because I want to know what God thinks about an issue. Because what God thinks about an issue should be important. And once you and I find out what God thinks about an issue, you and I should say, okay, well, if I'm following God, I should follow what he thinks about an issue. I can't go against God and say I'm, I'm walking with God. So whatever God thinks about an issue, our job is to fall right on line with that issue. And sometime in the future, we'll get to, to the book of Romans. We'll get through all of that. And we need to think of what God thinks about these issues. So God says, uh, listen to my son. Listen to what uh, the Bible says in uh, verse 8. It says, suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore. Moses is gone. Elijah is gone. Who's left? Jesus. Jesus. That's a sermon in itself. Everybody's gone, but only Jesus is left. If you focus on anything other than Jesus, it will eventually go away. That's why God says, hey, keep your focus on my son, Jesus. Moses is gone. Elijah is gone. But Jesus remains. And it says in verse 9, now as they came down from the mountain. I love the Bible. Now as they came down, that means they didn't stay. Peter wanted to, to stay, but Jesus says, no, we, we got things to, to accomplish. So he led them down the mountain. It says, and he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. His disciples still didn't understand how the Messiah, who was going to free them from the, the tyranny of, of Rome, how he was going to die, and not alone die, but be raised from the dead. Because listen to verse 10. It says, So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. So they're walking down the hill going, I'm not asking Jesus what that means. In verse 11, it says, And they asked him, saying, Well, quote, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And then he answered and he told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. So now the disciples are most likely remembering uh, a scripture in Malachi chapter 4. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So now, family, we have to ask ourselves, they just saw Elijah, so does that mean that the day of the Lord was at hand right then, or is it referring to a time in the future? So if you're new to following uh, you some Jesus, so Jesus, we, we're in the season what's called Advent. We're looking, we're going to celebrate his first his coming. So he, he was born as a, as a babe in a stable. That was his, his first coming. The Bible teaches that Jesus is coming again. That is his second coming. So in the scripture we just read, uh, Jesus said that Elijah, um, or they, they're asking, um, uh, Elijah must come 
come first? Well, what does that mean, that Elijah must come first? Uh, Some believe uh, in the book of Revelation that one of the two witnesses just might be Elijah. One of the, the two witnesses have power to cause a drought and to bring rain. Guess what Elijah had power to do in 1 Kings? Drought and rain. So just possibly uh, before Jesus' second coming, the two witnesses, one of them will be Elijah. And then as we have been through the book of Revelation several months ago, we know that his coming is imminent. So verse 12, it says, and how it is written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. Our second and last point is we must never forget. We must never forget. Here Jesus is reminding them once again that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. Let me read to you Isaiah 53. If you've never had the chance to read the chapter, it's, it's so beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Whatever that is. Oh, that's somebody's phone. Oh, I was like, I didn't know the building was equipped with that. I'm like, I'm just going to ride this out and see what's going to happen. Is somebody coming inside? This is why you never want to miss church. (laughs) Ever, ever. Never know what's going to happen. Man, we've had an interesting day. We've had the fire department. We've got Amber Alerts going on. Uh, New words created. And we still have 15 minutes. I'm looking forward to the rest of the 15 minutes. Back to the message. If your cell phones are silent. All right, we're good to go. Listen to Isaiah 53, starting at verse, uh, let's go to verse, let's read all. Uh, verse, uh, 50, Isaiah 53, it says, Who has believed our report, and to who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is speaking of Jesus. It says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Let's stop there for a second. So all your Jesus pictures are wrong, right? He's all handsome. He's all (laughs) hair down to his shoulders. He's probably, for most of you, bright blue eyes, and he's just, he looks handsome. That's not the biblical Jesus. The biblical Jesus would walk past every one of us, and we wouldn't even notice. We wouldn't go, hey, who was that? He would just walk by us and be like, back to the message. Listen to verse 3. He He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we, as it were, uh, we hid our faces, as it were, uh, from him. And he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus has experienced what you and I experience you ever been despised? You ever been rejected? You ever been a person of sorrows? We can never say, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. And he says, have you considered my son Jesus? Despised, rejected of men, afflicted. There we go. Good job, everybody. <laughs> but yet we esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Let me give you a few psalms and then we'll, we'll bring uh, our message home. Psalm 22 Verse 1, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? This is Jesus' words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken that you and I would not be forsaken. Think about this. You and I, as followers of Jesus, will never, ever, ever, ever be alone. 
Isn't that good news? That God has promised to never leave us. Even when, when, when we're not doing so good in life. Even when our actions aren't Christ-like. Think about this. God has said, I'm with you. Like, I, I'm, I'm with you. You and I know little of somebody saying, like, no, I'm with you. The closest we have old school is ride or die, right? Ride or die. That we all have a ride or die. And those of you that don't know what that means, that basically means that somebody in your life says, no matter what, call me. No matter what, I'm here. God, through his son Jesus, says, no matter what, I'm here. When you're good, when you're bad, when you're horrific, when you're stumbling around, when you're rolling around in mud, I'm here. Don't you love that, 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 that I'm here, that, that Jesus was forsaken, that you and I would not be forsaken? Psalm twenty two sixteen says, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. David is prophesying about the crucifixion a thousand years before it was even created. Let me give you one more in Isaiah 52 from the New Living Translation. It says, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. The Bible says that he, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. What joy is he talking about? Crazy, right? I'm not dying for any of y'all. I love you. It's not going down like this, right? And I'm sure you would all, you hear what I'm saying though? Don't leave here going, my pastor doesn't want to die for me. Sorry. Imagine Jesus dying for rebellious you. Jesus didn't die for you when you were all clean and washed and going to church and reading your Bible. Jesus died for you when you were, when we were steeped in our sin. He didn't wait for us to get better. He died for us when we were in darkness, hooked on whatever we were hooked on, that he died for us there. This is why we love us some Jesus. When God of very God says, come close. God of very God says, bring all of you to me. Bring the, the dark stuff. Bring the stuff that has a lock on it. Bring all of that to me. And he says, I won't leave you when we look at it together. He says, I won't leave. That's why we love us some Jesus. That's why my hopes are during, during times of worship that you're, you're closing your eyes and you're, you're going, Jesus, how, how great, how great you are. Jesus, how, how wonderful you are. Now, what is our, our sister uh, saying this morning? Uh, Jesus, just I, I love you, I love you, I love you. Because he first loved us. Not that God saw us and said, oh, how wonderful, magnificent you are. No, we love Jesus because he first loved us. We got to keep on going. Jesus, thank you for being good. It says, but I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Hmm, what does that mean, Jesus? Well, Matthew gives us the answer in Matthew chapter 17. Jesus answered, and he said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist came in the spirit and the power of Elijah the prophet. Does that make sense? He came and preached in that, that power, in that, that spirit of Elijah. And the religious, not only did they not repent, but they did not keep, uh, they did not uh, save John from being beheaded by King Herod. Jesus is good. Our focus should be on him and him alone. Let me give you three things to, uh, to answer this week. I normally give you uh, a few take-home points, but for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to give you some questions for you and your family, maybe even your, your, your group to, uh, to consider. The first one is, uh, how are you keeping your, your focus? How are you keeping Jesus your focus? How are you keeping Jesus your focus? The second question is, 
How are you daily hearing Jesus? How are you daily hearing Jesus? Then the last question for you is, which do you prefer, mountaintops or valleys, and why? Which do you prefer, mountaintops or valleys, and why?